a uh, show of hands, how many people out there are parents? Oof, that's more than I expected. Y'all, isn't it the absolute best? Yes. While somehow simultaneously be being the absolute worst. <laughs> right, Sean? <laughs> so I have two kids, one that also was born this, this summer, my son, so I feel your pain. And I have a daughter uh, who's three, her name is BB, or that's what I call her. Look, that's, that's her right there. And you know that old adage that your kid's personality is fully developed by the time they're three? Totally true in her case. Except that it was three months, not three years. <laughs> She's totally, totally unique. I'm here for it. I love it. She, ever since she was three months you know, old, she has loved these things that are traditionally considered feminine, like accessorizing with, with fingernail polish and earrings, and everything has to be a skirt or a dress. Last weekend at Halloween, she was a princess fairy. And if you didn't know, that's a princess with wings and a wand so she can fly and cast a spell on you as well. <laughs> and then on the other hand, since that age, she's also loved all these things traditionally considered masculine. She loves to fight and wrestle with me and play in the mud and go fishing. And also last weekend, the day before Halloween, we had our first solo camping trip together. Just she and I out at Jordan Lake. It was 45 degrees. She was a trooper. And I love that about her. But my favorite thing in that realm that she loves is since she was three months old, she has loved and been fascinated with big rig construction equipment. So much so that when she was two and my brother incorrectly referred to one of her toys as a bulldozer, she said, Uncle Bobo, that's a backhoe. <laughs> <laughs> so her favorite book right now is called The Little Excavator. And The Little Excavator, some of you may know this, the main character is Little E. It's one of those small excavators that you see on Interstate 40 with all the construction going on. And he's working with the big rig construction crew to build a public park that day. Okay, and he's trying to find where he can fit in, but he's not tall enough to reach high in the sky like the crane. He's not strong enough to carry the load of the dump truck or, or push the, the rocks and the debris like the bulldozer. And he keeps falling over all day and he, and he just can't keep up. And the big rigs are passing him by and just looking at him there on the ground. I'm like, sorry, little E, you're just too small. Oh. oh, right. But here's the thing. Little E wasn't too small. Little E was playing the wrong game. And this is something that we as adults do still, especially so in business. All right, so about five years ago, I released a documentary called Raise Up the World is Our Gym. And it was about a fitness uh, subculture called Street Workout. Street Workout, if you don't know, is a freestyle form of calisthenics. Calisthenics is bodyweight exercises, push-ups, pull-ups, dips. And one of their philosophies was movement is medicine, in fact. And this was a, a freestyle form of bodyweight. It wasn't like gymnastics, and so it was an art form. It was about doing things differently. They used park benches and scaffolding and street lights, right? And so that got really popular around New York and they put their videos out on YouTube when YouTube came out and whew, went viral all over the globe. They started getting organized, having teams, creating federations and having world championships. And I was the first person in the world to document this new sport. It became a new sport. This was uh, at, at a time where I didn't think I was ever gonna have kids <laughs> traveling the world for a couple of years. But because I was you know, that, that person, the first person to make a film about it, I was kind of an authority figure, right? So a lot of times they would ask me to be judges or to be a judge among the panel at these competitions. And every time I would inevitably see the same thing happen. You'd have these incredibly skilled and strong men and women that would get up there and they would do the same sequence of moves in the same set as everyone else, almost like they thought they would be penalized if they didn't. Now, mind you, this is not gymnastics, like a handful of moves that's about doing it perfectly. This was freestyle. It's about being different. And the problem it created for us, the judges, is that after seeing five or six or seven of seven of, of virtually the same routine, you couldn't tell the difference between a good routine and a great routine. After seeing 30 or 40 of them throughout the day, no one would stand out until one person would come up on that stage and do something different. It might not be the most technically challenging, but it was creative. More importantly, we, the judges, remembered it when we were tallying our scores. Being different is better than being better. 
But so much of our time and money and energy is spent chasing this thing called better. In fact, folks, we don't just want to be better, do we? We want to be what? The best. The best. I can hear my mom saying it right now. Baby, I don't care what you do in life, I will support you. Just as long as you're the best at it. <laughs> yeah. That didn't create any psychological issues at all. <laughs> so the problem with that mentality is it puts you in this perpetual state of competition with one another. Now, some of you might be thinking, so what's wrong with that? Rain competition is good. My mom probably thinks it too. Competition is good. It drives ambition. It makes you achieve great things. Hey, I agree. I'm ex extremely competitive. Even when it doesn't matter, like a family game of categories at Thanksgiving. <laughs> Take it serious. It's coming up soon, folks. <laughs> but the thing is, we don't talk about this underside, this, this dark side of competition that often, which is that many times, oftentimes, competitive nature is driven not by the feeling of winning, but by the fear of losing. And when you fear losing, it creates a scarcity mindset. You stop being creative. You stop being uniquely yourself because you don't want to stand out because you think that's going to get you to ax. They're not going to choose you. If you stand out and do something different, they're going to recognize you. Oh, you're not going to make it. You all know the legendary comedian Lily Tomlin? She once said that the trouble with the rat race is even if you win, you're still a rat. <laughs> when we get into that competitive state, that scarcity mindset, we all start doing the same thing as everybody else. And we look the same, just like a bunch of rats running at you and chasing a piece of cheese. We all start falling in line doing the same exact thing, trying to be the same. And that is a futile exercise because each and every one of us are different. We can never be the same. But each and every one of us are also the best in the world at one thing, being ourselves. Nobody can beat you at that. And if you lean into that and be your authentic self, you eliminate that competition. Now let's go back to the other perspective. You may not be a street workout athlete facing a panel of judges, but you most likely have a business that's facing a panel of potential customers. Even if you don't own a business, you might work for a nonprofit that's seeking donors or an association trying to grow its membership community. Or you may just be an individual with a social media account with an idea worth spreading. Folks, it's the same thing. People are going to compare you and criticize you. And just like us, the street workout judges at that competition, if you don't stand out, no one will remember you. Because at the end of the day, nobody cares about your credentials or what school you went to or your GPA or how much of an expert that you think that you are. Now listen, I know that will give some validation if someone's doing quality control to make sure you have your certifications. I get that. But no one will choose you because of that fact. I'll give you an example. I'm an Emmy-nominated filmmaker. You heard it in the bio. Now that may create, and it has created conversations when people see that on my LinkedIn profile. But take a guess how many clients have hired me because of that fact. Go ahead. Zero. Zero. They hire me because they've seen some of my work that makes them feel like I could do similar work and produce similar results for them. No one hires you for your, your expertise. They hire you for your unique perspective and approach to the work that you do. And that's because they specifically see something in your unique perspective they think will help them. Just like we are all different, they are all different. Their work is unique, their problems are unique, our solutions are not a one size fits all. If you and I are in the same industry, we shouldn't be doing things the exact same way. I shouldn't be able to take your website copy and put it on my website and it work. But we do that all the time. People say the same thing, just like the rats in the rat race. We, we value high quality work. Well, I hope so, Todd. <laughs> I hope so. Well, what, what do you do differently? In 2021, we've seen about a third of the U.S. labor force leave their jobs in a mass exodus that's been coined the Great Resignation. And at the same time, we've seen about a 40% increase in small business applications and entrepreneurship. Folks, that tells me that now, more than ever before in our lifetimes, people are trying to carve their own paths forward. They're tired of punching a clock for someone else to make profits. They don't care about their time or their, their opinions or their value or their lives. 
And to those folks and to all of us, I say stop focusing on your competition and trying to be better than them and focus on those you serve and try to be perfect for them. Your goal should be to find the unique intersections from your skills, your passions, and your experiences and find where they overlap that creates a lane where you can exist and exist alone with no competition. And then you figure out how you do what you do differently from others in your field and communicate that to the people who would benefit from that perspective the most. Once you understand who you could most deeply impact with your unique perspective is, you will understand that both the feeling of winning and the fear of losing pale in comparison to the joy of serving in a way in which only you can serve. Back in our book, The Little Excavator, the workday is done, little E is depressed and disheveled, still laying there on the ground. Oh. <laughs> but there's one more task left. In the middle of that park, there's a pond. In the middle of that pond, there's an island, and they need to cross a little bridge and dig and plant an apple tree there on that island. But all the big rigs are too big. They're too heavy. It's too tight of a space. They can't fit across it to do that. But who do we know that can? Little E. Little E. Little E crosses that bridge, he plants that apple tree, and thus creates a career path for him on the construction crew that he can exist, a lane that he can exist alone with no competition. And it was based on his unique abilities that were once perceived as flaws. We've talked about this a lot today. And he reframed his thoughts and the way he viewed them, and they have become his superpowers now. Folks, I believe with my whole heart that each and every one of us are uniquely designed to impact the world in a unique way. And that unique way is determined by your story. Plenty of people have your skills. And many of them are more skilled than you'll ever be. But no one on the face of this earth has your story. So use it wisely. My name is Rain Bennett. Thanks for listening. <laughs>